Good evening, buenas noches. Thank you for joining us for Ideas in Action with Carla Cornejo Villavicencio and Chiara Alegria Udes. My name is Marisa Franco. I'm director of Mi Gente here to introduce tonight's event. We are partnering with One World to create a virtual space for a conversation or a plática, mejor, uh, between two of our most insightful writers whose work illuminates the American experience through a Latinx lens. At Mi Gente, we believe Latinx and Chicanx people telling our stories is a critical part of the transformative change that we are fighting for. And both of these storytellers are writing Latinx stories with eloquence, elegance, and power. All of which are particularly important as our community is under attack by both a pandemic and by politicians. So Mi Gente is an organization that is a grassroots and a digital hub for Latinx and Chicanx change makers. Um, some of our work, um, historically, we've done the campaigns, um, you know, against deportations, looking at the role of, of uh, corporate technology companies facilitating deportations. We've been part of electoral campaigns that have ousted Sheriff Arpaio here in Arizona, uh, mobilized the Latinx vote in the Deep South for Stacey Abrams, and currently, um, fighting to uh, get Trump out of the White House this November. Um, most recently, we re released a report looking at the particular impacts of the COVID crisis on the Latinx community. Um, you know, these times, uh, you know, I think it's such a critical time to have these kinds of conversations because it is in these moments of crisis that the, the deepest, most difficult manifestations of, of what the impact is are often the stories least told, are the perspectives and experiences least understood. And at Mi Gente, we understand that part of our uh, role is to wage a political and electoral fight to transform those conditions. But we also deeply understand that it is also cultural and spiritual work and a response that is incumbent upon us in this time. Um, we understand that we have to do it. We have to tell our own stories. We have to save ourselves and each other. No one is going to do that for us. Um, and as I was preparing tonight, I thought about a dear friend and colleague, uh, Francisca Porchas, who is a host of this podcast, La Cura, um, which you all should all check out. Um, it, I was thinking about this moment and thinking about this event and, and resilience. And so I just want to bring her words into this space. We are engaging in the intentional practice of building resilience. We believe resilience is orienting towards life. It is taking the time and committing ourselves to building enough bandwidth to feel what bleak possibilities are in front of us without withering our relationship to joy, to purpose, to meaning making and to possibility. Um, tonight, Carla and Chiara will be in conversation with One World Executive Editor, Elizabeth Mendez Berry, who uh, I've met, I've known for several years, is a dear friend and a very respected colleague. Um, I'm so glad to always work with you, Elizabeth, and partner with you all, and so excited for this conversation. It's well-timed. Um, and to, to Carla and Chiara, thank you so much for your work and for your leadership in this time. It is so needed from our people, and we're so grateful. Elizabeth? Thank you so much, Marisa. Um, it is such a pleasure to be able to partner with you on this event. Um, when we were thinking about the conversation uh, between Carla and Chiara, part of our thinking was how do we bring the action piece and how do we connect um, the power of our cultural work and our storytellers and our artists with this moment and what's happening in the world. And Mi Gente definitely came to mind. They do the campaign work, they do the political work, but they have a strong understanding of the fact that la cultura cura. So thank you, Marisa. Um, so, so happy to be here in partnership with you tonight. And um, also just really appreciate the fact that your language justice league is providing in simultaneous interpretation, um, which we're really, really grateful for. And which makes this a welcoming space for so many more people. So muchísimas gracias a Alejandra, Marisa, and all of you. Um, before we get started tonight, I just wanted to take a moment um, to, 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 to think about, to honor those who have lost their lives uh, due to this pandemic. And 
especially also those who are struggling right now, whether they're struggling emotionally, physically, financially, in any way. So let's just think and hold those people in our hearts for one moment. Thank you. Welcome and bienvenidos y bienvenidas y bienvenidos um, to One World's Ideas and Action, episode two, episode dos. Thanks to all of you for joining us out in the big wide virtual world. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Um, big thanks to Marisa and the Mi Gente team and the One World and Penguin Random House crew for making this evening possible. And of course, a special thanks to our wonderful authors, Kiara and Carla. Um, we created this series with the goal of making virtual space uh, to connect with our community at a time when connection feels really, really important and necessary. One World provides a home for authors who give us a new language to understand our past, present, and future. It feels like that language is more needed than ever right now. We publish art, uh, authors like Kelly Fajardo and Steen, Maurice, Carlos Ruffin, I apologize for my children in the background, Mira Jacob, ta Coates, and many, many more. Before we get into tonight's conversation, I would like to just share a couple of reflections um, on what I see as some connective tissue between our previous conversation uh, between ta Coates and Heather McGee and the conversation tonight that also relate to what Marisa was sharing. One of the, the points that, that came up in that conversation was the idea that facts aren't always the issue. In fact, you know, they're, they're, many times they're not at all on the table. Data doesn't necessarily matter. Um, many times, people, if people are not fundamentally perceived as human, no amount of information is going to change how you know a particular group may feel about them so how do you address that you have to change the story and how the person is perceived fundamentally um, in order to be able to move forward and affect the the political change the electoral change that marisa is working for and so i i just wanted to suggest that i think carla cornejo villavicencio's debut the undocumented americans does precisely that and she focuses on a group that is usually portrayed as either villains or valedictorians. And she writes about them as people, complicated, kind, imperfect people. And the book is devastating um, and it's also hilarious. And, you know, I, I think that the, that's, um, a, you know, just an example of what we're trying to do at One World is, is to suggest humanity in places where um, there's a resistance to seeing it. And then also Chiara, Chiara Alegria Udes, is known for her beautiful plays in the Heights, but I've been reading her memoir in progress, which is coming out on One World 2021. And again, she's telling this story of growing up between two worlds, a world that's criminalized, a world that appears to be comfortable. And she talks about it with insight and tenderness, but no sentimentality. I am so grateful for how they, they write what they write and it is really an honor to be able to have this conversation with both of them tonight. Um, before we get started, I'm just gonna offer one quick, a couple quick logistical notes and then we're gonna get it started. Um, first of all, I hope that those of you who are on the Zoom can see the chat and there's gonna be lots of information exchanged and feel free to weigh in and contribute ideas. Um, I also wanna let you know that we're gonna share uh, uh, an email uh, newsletter tomorrow, I believe, that's gonna contain follow-up information about this event. It is going to be fun. So I suggest that you look out for it. Um, and that after we have the, the, uh, the back and forth between myself and Kiara and um, Carla, we're gonna open up to Q&A. And so please feel free to ask Q&A, um, to, to ask your questions via the Q&A little section at the bottom of your Zoom, if you're in the Zoom. If you're in YouTube, unfortunately, I don't think there's a way to ask a question, but uh, thank you for being here nonetheless. 
All right, so without further ado, I would like to get this conversation started and welcome these two incredible authors, Carla and Kiara, can you join us? There's what, yes, materialized, Kiara. Carla, hi, thank you so much. Um, so what I was hoping we could do to get started is have each of you just sort of plunge us into the world that you work with as writers um, by talking about one of the, the, the people, the characters, the subjects that you have written about and why and what was difficult about it, what was rewarding about it. Just take us into to a character, please. Kiara, you want to start us off? Happily, um, thrilled to be here. Hi, Carla. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Um, I am thinking about a, a play I wrote uh, back in 2004 that was set in Philadelphia, where I'm originally from. Um, hi to 215. I saw some people sign on from there. Um, at that, a few years before then, I had started to notice in North Philly young men walking around in, um, you know, like they're going off to boot camp, walking around in camos. And it became clear that this was going to be a new professional outlet now that um, a war had been declared, this was gonna be a new professional pathway in El Barrio for some time to come. And so I decided I wanted to write about um, Latino men in the United States military. I did a bunch of interviews in my family and my cousin was one such young person who enlisted in the Marines. Um, my uncle who was an Afro Boricua from the Bronx, um, he had been, he had served in Vietnam and uh, everyone in the family was like, oh, never talked to Theo George about Vietnam, he doesn't wanna talk about that. So I was quite nervous, um, but he's the most jolly guy in the world. He's like Boricua Santa Claus. Um, and so I asked him, you know, Theo, can I interview you about your experiences in the service? And my titi had warned me, you know, he doesn't talk about that. He sometimes has nightmares, blah, blah, blah. I was very nervous before interviews, Carla. I don't know if you get nervous before you interview people for writing, but I, you know, these thoughts of what right do I have to ask? Um, and what happened was, it was one of the, the learning moments in my writing life. Uh, I sat, I asked him one question, what year did you enlist? And he spoke for three hours, laughing, crying, very honest, and called me a week later and said, I feel 30 pounds lighter. And it, what I learned from that was something I knew instinctively, but got to see, which is that people need to, need space to share their narrative. People's narratives matter, and they don't always have the space to simply share. Um, so that's that's one character that I've written about. That became my play, Elliot, A Soldier's View. Thank you. Can I ask just a quick follow-up, which is how did he feel about being portrayed when he saw the play, or did he? Um, he he was great. He I was very nervous, but he watched the whole thing. It was in a like dank basement in New York. It was my first New York production. And he has this big pot belly. It's kind of like his armrest. And when he chuckles, like his arms go up and down with his belly and the, all the mannerisms I love. And, you know, he chuckled. And Jenny, uh, his wife was sitting right next to him and she cried. And then we all went out and broke bread and we're happy to be together as a family. Thank you. And Carla. Um, <clears throat> the person I, I write the most often about is my father, um, and whether or not I'm writing directly about him or I'm writing um, about other people, uh, other undocumented people, um, I'm always in some kind of way writing about my father. Um, the character people, the character, um, I say character because it's it's the way I wrote him that makes him a character. Um, he was a real human being. He was a day laborer named Ubaldo Cruz Martinez. And um, he was a day laborer in Staten Island and people uh, responded uh, really um, profoundly to his story, which um, was a representational um, challenge 
and was sort of risky to include in the book, which was a book about, you know, reporting. And um, I fictionalized his death. And um, so the way he died, he was a day laborer and all of the day laborers that I had interviewed him, they knew him or they knew of him. Like they'd all been around like for a long time, um, but no one really wanted to talk to me about him. And that's because day laborers have a bad reputation and he was kind of like the bad apple. And everyone was like, well, you know, you're giving us an opportunity to prove the stereotype wrong. So why would we tell you about the guy that proves the stereotype right? And um, so um, what I had read about him in English language media, which was very little, was just about his death, which was that he had died squatting in a basement. Um, he drowned during, uh, during Hurricane Sandy and that he was probably drunk and that um, his day labor friends told me he was an alcoholic. And as I researched more and more through my book and as my dad got older and older, um, I realized that a lot of aging migrant men have mental health issues that go undiagnosed, um, untreated, or um, self-treated. Uh, and um, I also, um, in an early draft of the book, um, I had, you know, said that like, you know, if I, if I like suddenly died and there was an autopsy made of me, who was like the perfect poster child for the American dream, um, what would an autopsy say about what was in my bloodstream? And for various mental illnesses that I have and like, you know, uh, just, you know, allergies and caffeine and, and, you know, all sorts of things. Like if I had a drink, um, there would be a way for Stephen Miller to spin my death into saying that I abused substances or, or something, you know, or that, or I could have had a bad day. And um, I didn't want to let that be his death. So I decided that since this country had taken so many of my people, and this country was definitely going to take my parents, although it didn't happen yet. Um, I felt like it was my um, it was my right as a as a writer, I'm not a journalist, um, to avenge his death. And so what I did was I fictionalized his death. I um, no one can say that what I wrote was not true because none of us was there. Um, I said, what if you are just like just as likely to believe that he was just like a bum alcoholic drowning in a basement. Um, and what if like the reason why he drowned in the basement is because he was rescuing an injured animal. And a lot of people that I know who are alone and live in single rooms in New York and are migrants care very much about animals like squirrels and pigeons. And that's the death I gave him. And um, it was an emancipating death and I felt like I was able to at least reclaim one death. Um, and I felt it was a uh, magical power granted to me by um, just, I guess, the mass loss of lives that um, have happened with, you know, this uh, long century of migration and um, now this wave of migrant writers that are here I feel like we have straightforward writing and then we have certain powers that are bestowed upon us. And one of mine is I can kill whoever I want in my writing and I can revive whoever I want. I, I get goosebumps. And I think, I mean, I think one of the things that hopefully we can talk about a little bit later is just that question of how you're bending the form with your, um, prose and I think we have containers that are very limited and you're playing outside of them. And so that's that's a really exciting part of this, this project, I think. Um, so one of the things that I was really excited about in, in having the opportunity to talk with you both is that I know that you really admire each other's work and that you, and also that you're challenged by each other's work in different ways. And so I was hoping you might talk a little bit about what that looks like. Kiara recently did a, a Twitter um, book club um, about the undocumented Americans, which is great. And I suggest everybody check it out. Um, but maybe 
Kira, if you could talk a little bit about what it was that drew you to to the book and you know what 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 you wrestle with in it. Well, what drew me to the book was that Chris Jackson, who um, heads One World um, yes. and who's a brilliant editor, told me in every meeting, I, every editorial meeting I went to him with, there's this really interesting book. There's this really powerful book. He kept talking about it and it was clearly on his mind. So I wanted it to be on my mind too. And when, when it was released at this particular moment in history, I kind of got, I got protective of a fellow author. I thought, oh no, this book that Chris has been um, tending to with, with such love and precision and power, is, it, is anyone going to know? Like what happens when a book gets released when um, so much of the world is shut down and so much of our daily foot traffic and commerce is shut down? And so that was the initial impulse. Then I cracked it open and um, I read, started reading and Garland in the introduction, just the assertion that this is not a book about heroes, it's a book about randoms. I was like, yes, this is, this is where I belong. This is where I want to be. Um, I'm so fascinated by the everyday person, the messy, complicated, average community member. Um, and that's exactly who I encountered in this book. One of, the, one of the tropes I've kind of struggled with personally throughout my life is the, the selfless maternal Puerto Rican abuela, tia. I was surrounded by them and I definitely inherited their um, first instinct of caretaking others through love, through nurturing, through food while internalizing my complications and not wearing them on my face. And I just, Gala just, I recommend this book so much. I'm guessing a lot of people on here have read already, but the, just the complete and utter unwillingness to engage that facade and let people be anti-heroes, be beautiful and repulsive in the same paragraph. This is, this is humanity. And so I loved it. You know, she's talking about a woman who was sick of being a mom. You know, she was sick who of- Who happens being to be mom. Colombian. She Sorry. lost her most years. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I loved that. I love that. She's talking about, um, you know, yeast infection medicine and dealing with this stuff that it's like, oh, we're not supposed to talk about that. Okay, that's just on page two. So I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> but um, I, I also did- learn a lot. Um, Carla says she's not a journalist, but she is a reporter in, in her soul and in her practice. And the reporting, I learned so much that I hadn't known. Um, I didn't know about the labor structures of the 9-11 cleanup. I, I did not know about that. Um, so I didn't know about the, even though I come from a family of contractors and carpenters, I did not know about the contractor to subcontractor to laborer hierarchy that was really um, disposing of and injuring a lot of people with very little visibility or accountability. So the learning curve and the humanity there, um, you know, I'm still grappling with a lot of that. It was very powerful. Yeah, I think one of the things that really struck me is that just the degree of curiosity that Carla brings and inquisitiveness and how that comes through. And that character that you just mentioned, the, the, the um, woman who left her family in Colombia and then wound up working um, around 9-11, she, she said, she's, Carla, correct me if I'm wrong, but she said, I'm an escape artist, you know? And she has this really kind of grandiose way of talking about her life, which I, you know, which I loved. And I, I just felt like there's so much power to people's own language, you know, and people's own way of understanding their own lives. Anyway. Enough about me. Carla, <laughs> can you speak to um, to just your reading of Chiara and all of that? Sure. Um, first, I'd like to say that I have a standing um, uncanceled subscription to rocketlawyer.com. Chiara, you may not know this, um, but you said that Christopher Jackson, my editor, treated me with, quote, love and precision and power. And I'd like to object to the love part 
Um, <laughs> my lawyers will be sending letters. Um, <laughs> the lawyer is available at rocketlawyer.com. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I've got an in-house public defender, so we can battle. We can battle. <laughs> I, I think yeah. my subscription is the lowest one, which is the one that I just used to send people NDAs that no one, no one signs. But um, so, uh, I mean, you are have been in my life for a very long time um, before I met you. Uh, my brother's on this Zoom call. Uh, Derek, do not unmute yourself. Um, you know, he he was very, very young. Um, I'm 10 years older than him. He was very, very young when I took him to see um, the New Haven production of In the Heights. Um, and it was my brother's first time seeing theater. I had seen, you know, I had done those programs where they take kids out of the ghetto who are good at writing and they like show them stuff on Broadway and off Broadway and, and like you write about it and stuff like that. But my brother hadn't. And this was the first time where he saw us on stage. And um, that really meant a lot to him. And, um, and, and uh, he started writing too. And I've never supported his career in writing because <laughs> I want him to make um, um, a lot of money because he has helped me take care of my parents. But I, it was just that first time, and I can't remember the first time that I saw myself represented. And I, but I was there for my brother's first time, and that was that was something that you wrote. Um, and and then you know, many years passed. I never thought our paths would cross. And um, you know, when I read your, I'm I'm really anxious and, and excited to read your memoir. Um, I'm really anxious to read about your life as a Latina who has had to, I know you, because you, ha I know you have been authentic to yourself in majority white spaces. And, and I know you have also experienced um, disappointment by people you thought you were your allies. But I, I also read your essay, which everyone should read here called High Tide of Heartbreak, where um, I, I'm not someone who's usually at a loss for words, and and I didn't know how to articulate um, everything that I had experienced as a young um, Latina writer who was just trying to make it and um, who wasn't, I guess, in it for the wrong reasons. Like I wasn't trying to become famous, or I wasn't trying to like get um, like a detox clean like tea sponsorship on Instagram. Like, I just wanted to tell the stories of my people and, and I wanted to make a living off of it. And I wanted to be treated respectfully. And, um, and I'm not, and I, and for my entire life, my parents were like, don't cry. If you cry, it shows weakness. And, and I absorbed that. And then when I, when, when the Trump administration happened, I internalized that to myself and and I started telling myself, if you cry, it means that Stephen Miller has won. And so I haven't let myself cry in a very long time. And, um, and then when I read your essay, like I just started sobbing because everything that you write about exposure and people noticing you and people revealing you and people having access to you, um, I felt I, I, you articulated it at all, but what also was just outstanding, like just, just bizarre to me was that I thought this was happening because I'm like, like young and inexperienced and, um, and like just this kid. And, um, and I realized that it doesn't go away and that you just have to learn to react to these things differently. And, you have to take care of yourself. And, um, and I have you. Um, and, and I've emailed you a lot um, throughout this experience with the book. And you've always been there for me. And I grew up, um, I've been writing professionally since I was 15 um, for all of the big publications. But most of my mentors have been white men. 
and um, there's always been something missing. And I think part of it was like, you know, can't, can't cry, can't cry, can't talk, can't like, you know, um, and so I just, it felt, um, it felt like finding kin um, when I, when our paths crossed um, because of um, one world. So, um, so I guess that's what your work means to me. So um, I think my eyeliner and my mascara are still in place and I think I can proceed as a moderator, but that meant a lot to me too. Um, you know, just, just to hop in there, one of the yeah. things that, that the essay says just very simply is, and, and this harkens back to the mom from Colombia who left, she left her family and you know, she asserted her right to fuck convention. Oh, I don't, I don't remember what the um, rules are about curse words, sorry. Um, you know, and on a much smaller scale, but I, I as, as a writer and the kind of writer I am, I, I believe in the detail, I believe in the granular, I believe in the one grain of sand. Um, and that what the essay was basically about at its core was, if I hurt, I think I'm at a point in my life where I would like to say ouch out loud. That's it. And, um, you know, part of, part of how we do that, you know, it's, it's not even saying I demand the right, you know, to get, to be righted. It's just, the act of articulating, I, I'm gonna, I wanna say ouch. I wanna learn to say ouch in front of you all here, um, you know? And, and one of the ways that, that we do that is, I think by just supporting each other in true community, you know, I have no doubt that there's a lot of writers watching this um, who are experienced and who are inexperienced, but I do know we need every one of the stories that those writers are gonna tell urgently. Um, you know, and that kindness from, from one writer to another, it's, it's a little bit of medicine. It helps us just take the next step in the day. So I just want to say one thing because um, I just started working at One World a few months ago, and Chris Jackson is the reason that I'm here also. Um, and just a note of appreciation to him for, for that generosity and that um, curiosity that he brings, and also for pitching me really, really, really hard on publishing, because this is just the two of you Carla's book was the galley was in his office when I was meeting with him and I stole it and I read it and then I was like okay I can take this job you know this is really really powerful um, work and actually from here I was hoping we could talk a little bit about something that you Kiara have talked about a lot um, or maybe not a lot but there's the talk that you gave about the role of art as a disruptor and its power to um, maybe part of it is saying ouch loudly, publicly, and with feeling or with physicality. Um, but I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I hope you didn't hear that. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the, the incident at Yale um, that, you, that you've celebrated um, and, and sort of meditated on, uh, and if we could start there. Sure, I was, I was an undergraduate student at Yale. At Yale, there's uh, the structure of how of student housing and student meals um, is through college, residential colleges. So smaller portions of the undergraduate community live in different residential colleges. And one of those colleges was named Calhoun College um, after John C. Calhoun, who um, was one of the um, highest ranking pro-slavery advocates and vocal and passionate pro-slavery advocates that the White House has ever seen as, um, as vice president. He was also a senator. Um, 
in Calhoun College, when Henry Louis Gates was in Calhoun College, I believe, they were already saying, change the name, change the name. That was a few decades ago. Um, they were still saying, change the name, change the name. And, and what happens physically in the space of Calhoun College is that there are portraits, there are stained glass windows that depict Calhoun. And some of these images include um, pastoral and noble uh, visuals of him as a slave owner. So they've been kind of discreetly taken down one by one over the years. Um, but there was one that remained in the dining hall and um, a long time Yale dining hall employee who hadn't noticed it because he had poor vision from his diabetes. It was brought to his attention that there was a small stained glass panel um, where he worked that depicted um, two enslaved people with bales of cotton on their head and like pleasant smiles on their faces um, depicting their enjoyment of this activity and of their situation. So as soon as he saw that about a week later, he took a broom handle and smashed out the stained glass window and it became a big controversy at Yale. He was fired uh, from his job. He was later reinstated. I came up to New Haven pretty quickly and asked him if he would be in conversation with me and um, I, that I wanted to hear his story and share his story if he felt comfortable with that and he was game. So I get, ended up giving a speech at Yale recently um, with the president of Yale about breaking things. Um, Corey Menifee, who was the dining hall employee, he, this, this speech is unpublished, so th there's not gonna be a link to it, but um, Corey Menifee and I both were a year apart. We came up in the late 80s, early 90s at a time when hip hop and break dancing and street art and graffiti art and broken windows policing and all that stuff um, was reaching a, a kind of climax. Um, and so I was looking at art as at art as a form of disruption. We both have that background aesthetically as kids. And my, my feeling was that by kind of breaking Yale, he bettered Yale. He loves Yale, let me tell you, he loves Yale. He wanted to, he wanted his job back. He loves the students when you talk to him, but he wasn't, he couldn't look at that panel. Um, and so I think uh, the notion of art and disruption for me that the question is, well, disruption from whose point of view, right? Because that was a profoundly disruptive act from Yale's point of view. It disrupted their mythology. It disrupted their physical property. Um, but from his, Corey's point of view, it was essentially, a step towards wellness and um, reconciliation of his own dignified working conditions. Um, you know, so there's, it's that flip side of the coin, the disruption as a creative act. Carla, do you wanna jump in? Um, yeah, I am. Um... When I, when I, so, I mean, my, like, this is like off brand for me, but I'm um, getting my PhD at Yale. And um, the reason why I'm in grad school, um, I have a couple of my friends who are um, professors or in grad school. My partner is a professor, like, I get it. Um, but <laughs> it's because I needed the health insurance. So I just need to submit my dissertation and then I'll be done with it. I just haven't really wanted to. Um, but um, I read a lot of books on migration and I didn't like them. And like, like you can read that, you can like Google me and, and like find like me just saying that over and over again. But like, um, so what I want to say is that like, um, it's just so bizarre how like we reject some of our influences and then we're like, we are, we like find our influences anew. So like for a long time, I was just complaining about magical realism. I was just like, oh my God, like, like every white girl is like, oh my God, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And like, first of all, like, I don't like it when people pronounce my name, Carla Cordejo Villavicencio. And let me explain why. My parents call me Nena. Um, um, my people, my family in Ecuador calls me Marcela or Marcelita, which is my middle name. 
Um, people in the congregation that I grew up with, in the church that I grew up with, call me Carlita. Migrants who I interview call me Carlita. No one calls me Carla, except English speakers. So when I am introducing myself in English, my name is Carla. Carla is something that exists in the minds of people who think that um, I would like to be called that in order to forge intimacy that does not exist yet. Um, so like I, I uh, know a lot of people feel like some type of way about rolling their R's and stuff, um, but I do not attach politics to pronunciation at all. If you've read my audio, if you listen to my audio book, you will, um, you will know that I um, have a very like idiosyncratic pronunciation of English and Spanish throughout the book because I belong to the 1.5 generation. Mm -hmm. You know, like I came here when I was five. I speak Spanish fluently. I learned to read in Spanish first, but I write and think in English. Like I attach no politics to pronunciation. And um, that was just an, an aside to just um, shit on academia for a second. But I will say, say that um, I, I rediscovered Gabriel Garcia Marquez at, at around the time that I was having like a religious reckoning of my own where I was just like, how could all of this evil shit be happening? And like nothing, nothing is happening in nature. Like there's, there's no like, um, I remember what, being a child, first I was Catholic and then Jehovah's Witness. And I, I, I knew the Bible intimately and I knew that when Jesus died, God was angry and there was an earthquake and like the, the skies darkened all around the world and there was an earthquake. And so God was mad and he let it show through the, through the world, like in a physical way. And, um, and then I grew up being like the Holocaust happened. Like what was the physical manifestation and was there like a mass tornado like and I know the right tries to say like you know like gay people like make you know like hurricanes happen and stuff but I was just so angry that there was no like 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 worldwide um witnessing of our pain and ours I meant like migrant pain what was happening on the border what was happening you know with family separation. And then I discovered that the answer was, as had always been, magical realism. And magical real realism, aside from just a literary technique, um, at least in the, in the Latin American context, in the Latino context, is a way for us to make sense of things in kind of a religious way. To be like, well, the judges don't listen to us, the police doesn't listen to us, there is no justice, but, like, you know, if my child has been killed by paramilitaries and I bury my child in my garden, there will be like a cherry, like a cherry tree that like you squeeze the cherries and blood comes out. And that's justice. You know, that's a witnessing of our pain. And that's how I rediscovered Garcia Marquez. And then I was reading about what Garcia Marquez reads and like Garcia Marquez's approach to journalism, which he did, and his um, approach to um, writing um, Testimonios, which influenced my book, um, uh, led me to um, The Metamorphosis and Kafka. And, um, and I just remember the first line, um, you know, when Gregor Samsa like woke up one morning from an unsettling dream, like he woke up and he realized that he had been turned into a monstrous vermin. And I was like, I did not know that books were allowed to begin that way. And that also seemed to be our reality. Like one minute we were migrants wearing white in 2006, marching down like Fifth Avenue in New York, asking for comprehensive immigration reform and asking for rights for dreamers. And the next minute we were literal vermin who were bringing contagious diseases across the border and who raped us and murderers. And I was like, well, what if that isn't something that I just like tweet about, but what if I just turn this into something that is like manic and grotesque and punk and angry and um, confusing and something that people, that when people read, it makes them feel like they have a fever. Um, and so it was just like a bunch of influences that I had rejected before and a bunch of influences that like people wouldn't think would influence me. 
like I also like you know I like when I talk to kid, kids of migrants I'm like like when I when you read my book I want you to feel like the way you'd feel after a rock concert you know um and so that's how I feel like I disrupt um Latino literature because Latino literature is often like about like like abuelita doing this and like making tamales and shit and I just have never related to that and I've just been like I woke up one day and I was a cockroach and that is the story of my Latinidad um in 2020 um and so that's the story that I'm telling right now Thank you. So that makes me think about something that we had been in touch about before, which is the idea of where our storytelling was before. I mean, like from 2006 to 2016, maybe. Um, and then now in the context of the pandemic and beyond, I'd love to, to hear you both talk about what this moment and what what you just described that transformation into a cockroach you know what that means um exploring a little bit further some of the ideas that you just shared carla and kiara if that makes sense should i start sure oh no i feel like legends should start first but you're on a roll <laughs> um, okay. Um, I don't know. How I feel like people, like literary people, have these questions all the time. They were like, "How how do we write like a novel after nine eleven? You know?" And they're like, "You know, can we write the nine eleven novel?" And Hollywood figures it out first, and then they do like do a lot of offensive shit. Um, literature changes. Um, I don't know, do we have my partner who <laughs> teaches um, the 20th century history? Um, you know, um, literature changes after World Wars, literature changes literature change after the A-bomb. Personally, what, what I'm trying to do in my own writing um, is, first of all, the first thing you need to do to write something profound is keep yourself alive. So that's my first step. And the second step is you keep people close to you alive. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And the, the third step is um, you just soak yourself in influences. And I'm not reading anything about pandemics um, because I feel like that's a little too on the nose. Like I feel like my favorite musicians when they're like, um, when like Radiohead is like, I want to write an album about like cyborgs and depression. They don't like seek that out exactly. They don't like Google that, you know? So I feel like people who are reading about pandemics right now are like, it's just like, why are you self-harming? Um, I think, so I'll tell you exactly what my plan is um, because my partner is not in the room. Um, I. Um, I'm like, it's pretty likely that I had COVID back in late February, early March, and um, I'm trying to get tested for antibodies at Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, and um, I'm trying to get my partner on a good day. She kind of controls me. If anyone here is a Fiona Apple fan, she's like the Zelda to my Fiona. So she really kind of says what goes. And so I'm trying to get her to let me go to Queens to do some reporting. I'm from Queens. My family lives in Queens. My parents live in the epicenter of the epicenter of the pandemic. Their hospital is Amherst Hospital. We know a lot of people who are sick. We know a lot of people who have died. And I've read um, you know, pretty much all of the high profile mainstream publications, long form essays on Queens. And um, I feel like none of them have gotten it right. I think I can get it right. I just need to go there. <laughs> and um, I think I'm, I'm close to being allowed to go. Yeah. And um, so <laughs> um, that is my plan. I think that the important thing is that we understand that the mood right now is, the tone right now is um,
like the tone right now is probably um It's probably one where most people are able to understand something that I think usually pockets of populations are able to understand, which is survivor's guilt. Um, and I think that that is something that a lot more artists should probably will probably be um, working with as a, as a as an idea or as an affect. I think it's usually like, you know, like um, survivors of extreme violence, survivors of genocide, survivors of war, survivors of um, a lot of things experience survivor's guilt. But I think as a, as a, as like a, as a, as a population, as a country, we're going to be reckoning with that. And I think that's going to be reflected in art. So that's just my specific idea of what I think I'm going to be doing is just doing a lot more writing about Queens um, because it's just been so devastated. Um, but I don't want it to be just an elegy. Um, so I just have a lot more thinking to do. Uh, a few thoughts come to mind. I was speaking with my mentor, Paula Vogel, and a group of playwrights, and she said, you know, what is theater after, after this? How do we rebuild theater? And I, someone had recently actually given me the answer to that question. I had it at the ready, which is, um, an artist named Yasmani Arboleda, he um, works with me on my prison writing project, Emancipated Story. And I asked him to come on board as one of our core volunteers because I was, I'm going to curate, hopefully, an exhibit of um, these pages written by people behind bars in the fall in New York. And um, so I needed an artist to help me conceive of how those, that um, gallery would look. And there would be a performance as part of this gallery. And so as Yasmani was thinking about, well, how do we do this? He said, I think, I think rather than having like a set design or a gallery design, the people who come to see these things actually have to build it themselves together. They have to build the audience bank together. They have to build the space they're gonna inhabit together. And I said, well, that's, that's what theater has to, has to be now. You don't go sit in a velvet chair and, and wait for it and wait for the content to come your way. It's not like a content mode. It's a literal, we build our paradigm together. And I have no illusions. I'm not a cynical person. I don't think that, I wish I could share the optimism of people who are like, is this gonna lead to all sorts of change? I'm usually not cynical, but I have my doubts. I think habits stick real deep in our gut, but. I do think there will be space in the artist community and in writing um, to actually physically and paradigmatically even rebuild what the notion of a reader is as I'm writing on the page and how I reach my hand out. And if that's saying in the first sentence, I am grotesque, I'm a cockroach, therefore, if you're reading about me, then you are grotesque too because I am you, um, you know, that, that reach through the page or that reach across the stage becoming a more of a circular impulse. Thank you. So kind of uh, in the same family of, of questions, I'd love for, first of all, I just want to ask people to Put your questions in the Q&A because we're going to transition to the Q&A portion pretty soon. Um, and then I, I wanted to ask you both how you're doing now, how you, you know, get up in the morning, like what are the, what are the things that are enabling you um, to make it through this time? And, um, and if you want to say anything, something that Carla had shared before about how, who you, who, who you're kind of showing up for in that way as well. Um, I'd like to hear from Kara first for this one. Um, I have a, a little mantra I've been trying to uh, metabolize into my spirit, which is about do more, accomplish less, do nothing, accomplish everything. Well, this is a perfect time to try to put that into practice. I have, I have reached a moment in my 
career and in my age and in my life and in my family where I, I think I'm pretty good at the do less, accomplish more. I think the do nothing, accomplish everything is, is important right now for artists um, because everyone's kind of having to question their, um, how productive they are and their pro the value of productivity right now um, has been shifted. And so I think, you know, for writers, the notion of constant productivity is not particularly helpful and that gestation is so crucial um, for getting at the story. You know, I have some stories that took me 17 years to write. I have some stories that took me a year to write, but usually they, it takes a long time for them to grow. Um, so I'm trying to do nothing and accomplish everything. And I'm also, I, I hopped on a great uh, Facebook concert this morning of my friend Michelle Camilo, who's a wonderful Dominican jazz pianist. Um, the music's really keeping me whole. I love La Cura podcast that Mi Gente does, um, really focused on wellness. Um, my sister was brewing me some ginger tea this morning. Then she botched the vegan mac and cheese she was trying to make. So mm -hmm. that was kind of a wash. Um, the little, the little things, the details, the wellness details. Thank you. Um, well, me, I am, um, I know that um, in the long term, I'm working on um, healing. Talia, my partner, has some books that she leaves by my desk. Should I just, um, like take some moments away from working or doing my makeup to um, glance at them. I'll, I'll let you take a sneak peek at them. Um, there's this one called The Body Keeps Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. I have not looked at it. Um, there's Prisoners of Childhood, The Drama of the Gifted Child, and the search for the true self. I took a sexy Instagram with it, um, but I didn't read it. Um, so I'm not on that journey of healing yet, but my partner really wants me to be. Um, so I enjoy um, the care and the support. Um, what I find healing is that while I am not yet at the point where I can say, um, the reason why I live and remain alive is for all um, is for is for myself is because I think I am worth it and I think that I deserve what Marshall Linehan, who invented DBT, calls a life worth living. I think many of us who are children of immigrants or who are immigrants or who are people of color or who are caretakers often um, live for other people to take care of other people to nurture other people, to save other people, uh, to serve. And um, those are all reasons why I think my life is meaningful. And I know that that's not enough. Um, and so it's going to take me a while. I, I mean, I just turned 30. And I think that it's gonna take me a while, but what I have been leaning into is small things that I know are true about me every day that, um, will make me want to wake up every morning and um, they all have to do with my senses which is also classic dbt so it's like i know that in the morning i will very much enjoy the first sip of a cup of coffee that my partner makes for me but i always enjoy it and it makes me feel good and so i know that that is true about me and i feel that way every day i know that i like um scented body lotions and I like putting them on after a shower. Um, I know that I like, like memorizing choreography of like Selena songs or like um, Cheyenne or Ricky Martin songs and like FaceTiming my mom and performing them for her um, because she's horrified and then she finds it funny. And I know like that that is a moment that is something I look forward to in my days. So I think for like any of the listeners here are people who I think just like all of us are people who are finding reasons to live that are just not, um, I think re reasons to live and reasons to keep going shouldn't just be um, like large abstract things like faith and God and my people and my community. It should be very specific things, you know, um, because 
because your bubble can be burst very quickly if it's things like faith and God and community and family. Um, I think it should be very specific things. It's like, like I have a podcast that I like that is about cults and um, it comes out every month and I really look forward to it. It's hour, it's hour long and that is a reason for me to keep living month by month. And I think that is um, a very good mental health technique that I recommend to people who struggle. And um, that is what sustains me. You know, I, um, I remember seeking anointment when I was younger in um, mentors or writers and artists because I venerated them. And um, I don't think there's anyone here who <laughs> would have this connection, but of course I love James Baldwin. And James Baldwin was a beacon of hope for me during um, the entire Trump administration. And I had read in James Baldwin's Paris Review interviews that um, William Styron had been very important to him. And he defended him with the Nat Turner stuff. And he, um, he would stay at his house when James Baldwin wasn't feeling so well. He would stay at William Styron's house like for a weekend, for a week, like as a mental health retreat. And when I was not feeling so well, I found that William Styron had a son who was a therapist mm -hmm. and I went to him. It was not a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not a good experience for racial reasons. And I felt like the universe was against me. I felt like the people who had, who had uh, like Moses leading the Israelites out of the desert, I was like, but it, he's a styron. Like his dad helped James Baldwin. Like I should, and that's not, that's, it's, it's not where you expect to find it. Like where, where I found it was like, um, if you've read my book, or if you haven't, there's two teenage girls in one of the chapters in my book who I um, have taken on like a like a, an other mother auntie kind of role because their dad was in sanctuary and he had a deportation order, and they're like really annoying and really bratty, and um, they will like send me like screenshots of of them on my Amazon account looking up vape pens, like calling ne just asking for negative attention just so I can mother them. And like, that is what nourishes me. And that's what keeps me going and helps me and makes me happy. Um, it's not where you have been told you are going to find enlightenment. Um, and I don't even remember what the question was. Daily nourishment. Yeah, well, you know, coffee, et cetera. <laughs> I think you covered it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now we're going to pivot to some questions and my lovely assistant, Chris Jackson, is sending them over. Um, the first is, what has been hardest for you to write in your work? Is that for Carla, I presume? It's for both of you. Um. Uh, originally, I, I, I was writing for um, pretty angrily at a white audience, but um, that was under a different editor. And as soon as my editor became Christopher Jackson, he smacked that right out of me. Um, I think for me, I there, there's been some fear around um, writing Latina characters that in in the major regional theaters and on Broadway and et cetera, et cetera. And it gets done in theaters that have a, a primarily white audience base. Um, that always gives me a lot of anxiety. Um, I, I cherish those productions and I've had wonderful experiences, but I, it always makes me feel ill at ease to um, the performative elements of culture and the imbalance between um, like story and recipient of story. Um, another hard thing recently working on this memoir has been, I always write about other people. And this is the first time I'm really writing about myself transparently and trying to get 
as honest as possible. And so basic in the process of doing that, I just had some realizations about who I am, honestly, that weren't, were not particularly likable. You know, I remembered an experience being honestly disgusted by someone in my family and not in for fair reasons. And to grapple with that and to name that, that was a wake up call for me, remembering that. Speaking of not crying, I mentioned to Carla that I also, you know, realized that even though this book was kind of ostensibly written to mourn um, and resuscitate the lives of cousins lost in the 80s and 90s to AIDS and addiction, prostitution, prison, um, that I had never cried for any of those losses. I didn't, I didn't really clock that or register that till I was writing the book. And I'm like, all right, where's the big tear, teary moment? Where's the big heartfelt like, oh, then I felt it all. And I was like, oh, I never, I never wept. I never. And so um, this is maybe kind of a little bit related, which is, um, were there stories uh, you wish you included maybe in, in this book or in a, in, that you wish uh, that you edited out? So stories that in retrospect you wish you had included. Thank you. My biggest regrets writing wise, and this has to do a little bit with theater practice too, are when I edit, when I have edited things um, to explain. There's a real like hunger in a lot of theatrical practice for the audience to like understand something. Um, and it took me a long time and many productions and many plays to realize that how anti art that is. Um, so I think some of my early plays, not first drafts, but in the editing process suffered from that lack of awareness. There's some explanations in there. One of the things that I really love about working with Chris on this book is that when I use Spanish, I'm like, I don't want it to be italicized. There, I want to break the language and I want to break it how I want to break it without explanation. Um, yeah. And I have a very specific question for you, Kiara, which is how do we learn more about the prison project? The Prison Project is called Emancipated Stories, um, and it's on, it's a collection on Instagram. So if you go to Instagram and go to emancipated underscore stories underscore project, you will see them. Uh, we are open to anyone who is currently behind bars in any sort of facility. So that could be a prison, a jail, um, a youth, a juvenile detention facility, um, and any sort of immigration detention. And the invitation is simply send us one page of your life if that would be helpful, useful for you. Emancipate one page of yourself and share. And what, what the authors get in return is a, a letter written directly to them engaging their humanity and their peace. So it's not a shot in the dark. Um, if their work is performed in the future, um, they, they receive updates about who has encountered their work and how. Um, and the notion, this was inspired by the AIDS quilt. I was thinking about the AIDS quilt. I remember when it came to DC for the first time and it stretched, it like was too big for DC. And I thought, oh God, I wish I had some skill like that to address this problem of prison that affects me deeply and personally and affects so many people in this nation deeply and personally. I was like, well, I'm good with pages. Like I'm good with paper. I couldn't make a quilt, but like, I can organize a page. And so I called up my cousin who was serving a prison sentence in um, a state correction facility at the time. And I said, I have this idea, would this be helpful? And he was like, yes. And so we did it together. He was kind of inside. He started getting us our first submissions. We got our materials together. And speaking of what's been bringing me joy in this time, it has been um, working with our team of volunteers and just going through these letters and these pages and um, really decentering ourselves for, you know, the five minutes or hour that we spend on that a few times a week. Beautiful. All right. I'm very sadly, we have to wrap up, um, but I'm so grateful to both of you for, for what you write and, and for this time together. And um, I think a lot of us 
are just really, really grateful um, for, for what you've shared tonight. So thank you. Thank you for being part of the One World uh, family as it is. And uh, thanks to everybody who made this evening possible. And uh, we look forward to being in touch soon. Uh, like I said, that email is gonna be, there's gonna be a mixtape, there's gonna be good things. So look out for it. It should be coming your way uh, very soon. Thank you and good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.